there's a humorous internet game you see pop up every once in a while called by various names like Who Said It? Where the writer gives you a list of quotes and you have to choose between two choices to whom each quote should be attributed. Recent ones I've seen include Adolf Hitler or Taylor Swift, which is surprisingly difficult to tell those two apart. <laughs> Dick Cheney or Phil Leotardo from The Sopranos. Joe Biden or Michael Scott from The Office, <laughs> and Stephen King or Justin Bieber. But maybe the one most apropos to our event tonight, SpongeBob SquarePants or Confucius, <laughs> on which I only scored a seven out of 14. <laughs> so check that out, see if you can do better. A similar game might be played between our guest tonight, David Hinton, and any number of Chinese sages. Not played for laughs, of course, but to demonstrate the deep impression a lifetime of learning can have in shaping the mind of one who studies with great concentration over many years. To read David Hinton's translations of the Chinese classics, and of course we put a lot of implicit trust in translators, is to experience an uncanny feeling of being, being at home in a foreign land. One wants to belong there, one takes pleasure in the effort to belong there, but one is left finally with a long way to go. Fortunately, when the works themselves invite us to take up that journey, when Lao Tzu says, the further you explore, the less you know, we take some solace in the fact that the translator has gone before us and acts as intermediary, showing us, and his introductions, which are short masterpieces of the form, they do this kind of work. But that, that journey, however treacherous or arduous the way, treasures await to reward our efforts. The nature of those riches of that possible inheritance is in part what you will learn about tonight. We live at a decadent time. But when I say decadent, I don't mean merely to say that our culture is indulgent, as in decadent chocolate cake, which is how we usually use that word. No, I mean decadent in the sense of our lateness, of what happens once a project is complete, once there are no more frontiers, no more buildings, nowhere else to grow. We feel like all the books are written, all the truths have been spoken, and we each take up residence within our minor specializations at best, within our lazy pleasures at worst, and rely on other specialists, the so-called experts, to tell us everything we need to know. Ralph Waldo Emerson, over 150 years ago, noted this decadence in American culture then, when he opened his first book, Nature, saying, our age is retrospective. It builds the, sepulcher, the sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? The motif that ties together all of, Mer of Emerson's writings, as is also the prevailing thesis of his student, Henry David Thoreau, is our need to return to the source of creative power embedded within nature itself, our nature and the non-human order's nature, a source for ethics as much as art. They called for the writer to be a spiritual adventurer, to make of herself a vessel for understanding, an observant soul wandering even at home. They understood, like the Chinese poets, what perhaps we mostly lack, that one's orientation must be essentially firstly mystical, if we are to have any hope at all of getting anything else right. It might not surprise you then, or at least it won't after tonight's talk, that in 1860, Henry David Thoreau owned the largest library of Eastern classics, Chinese and Indian texts mostly, in the entire New World. This lecture series is named in honor of the poet William Stafford, and he would most certainly be considered an heir to the sensibilities of Emerson and Thoreau as much as he would acknowledge Tu Fu and Li Po as forerunners, and that his basic posture toward the world and others was first and foremost reverent. He listened. To take an image from David's book, Hunger Mountain, he bowed. He learned this primarily from his mother, a devoted Quaker. And since we don't talk much about the inner light around here, it might surprise you that the faith of Walter and Emil Malone, the founders of this school, might and should also be characterized as essentially mystical. Some have questioned the importance to an institution that grounds itself in Christian thought and precepts of listening to a talk about the spirituality of ancient China. And out of all that I might say to that and have, I'll just quote Olivier Clement, who opens his important book on the ancient Christian tradition with the sentence, Christianity is in the first place an oriental religion, and it is a mystical religion. 
From his perspective, what you will learn tonight is not just a bit of dusty cultural history, a spot of exoticism to help make you a person more, as they say, well-rounded. Instead, it's something vital, the recovery of something lost, a corrective, maybe even a revelation. Theology, after all, is not something that should be learned from books alone, but rather is the fruit of an encounter with the numinous source of all being, an attempt to find language to fit that experience and the effort to live in harmony with it, to live up to and into the thing itself, even a thing which is, of course, not a thing. Above all, why I invited David, David Hinton here is, as I said from the start, not simply out of respect for his learning and his achievements, which are considerable. He is the first in more than a generation to translate all of the major Chinese texts, which now exist in a, in a single bound volume, which is also for sale, 20% off by the by the <laughs> But for the way in which his study has formed his life, for the depth of insight and attention, for the passion of conviction with which he brings to his living, he is truly a man after Emerson who enjoys an original relation to the universe. I am most happy to welcome him to Malone University to deliver this lecture, so please help me welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm honored to be the, the uh, William Stafford lecturer this year. And, but that was such an eloquent introduction, I feel like skipping my lecture and just leaving it at that. Um, but I will be, it's funny that he would bring up that original relationship with the universe, because that's essentially everything I'm going to talk about today. But I'm gonna, I want to start, um, I was on the plane here, I remembered that uh, this is a, a children's book by William Stafford, and I read this to my daughter probably 400 times, and I thought of it on the way here, and I thought, maybe if I start reading the, re the, the talk with that, it would be nice. So I'm going to read this children's book to you, <laughs> maybe more for me than for you. I've never, done, I've never started a talk with a children's book. Um, you can't, I can't really show you the pictures. You can see that's the animal. That's how they picture the animal you're going to hear about. It's kind of like a bear. Other than that, I don't think you need to see them. <laughs> One day across the lake where echoes come now, an animal that needed sound came down. I don't know if I can read this. I'm going to start crying. It's, I, it's like I'm talking to my daughter 20 years ago. He gazed enormously, and instead of, wait, uh, oh yeah, I just remembered. We changed all the he's to she. I'll do that. She, <laughs> she gazed enormously, and instead of making any, she took away from sound. The lake and all the land went dumb. A fish that jumped went back like a knife, and the water died. In all the wilderness around, she drained the rustle from the leaves into the mountainside and folded a quilt over the rocks, getting ready to store everything the place had known. She buried thousands of autumns deep, the noise that used to come there. Then that animal wandered on and began to drink the sound out of all the valleys, the croak of toads, and all the shiny little noise grass blades make. She drank till winter and then looked out one night at the stilled places guaranteed around by frozen peaks and held in the shallow pools of starlight. It was finally tall and still, and she stopped on the highest ridge just where the cold sky fell away like a perpetual curve. And from there she walked on silently and began to starve. When the moon drifted over that night, the whole world lay just like the moon, shining back that still silver. And the moon saw its own animal dead on the snow, its dark, absorbent paws and quiet muzzle and thick, velvet, deep fur. After the animal that drank sound died, the world lay still and cold for months. And the moon yearned and explored, letting its dead light float down the west walls of canyons and then climb its delighted, soundless way up the east side. The moon owned the earth 
its animal had faithfully explored. The sun disregarded the life it used to warm. But on the north side of a mountain, deep in some rocks, a cricket slept. It had been hiding when that animal passed. And as spring came again, this cricket waited, afraid to crawl out into the heavy stillness. Think how deep the cricket felt, lost there in such a silence. The grass, the leaves, the water, the stilled animals, all depending on such a little thing. But softly it tried, cricket, and back like a river from that one act flowed the kind of world we know, first whisperings, then moves in the grass and leaves, the water splashed and a big night bird screamed. It all returned, our precious world with its life and sound, where sometimes, loud over the hill, the moon, wild again, looks for its animal to roam, still, down out of the hills, any time. But somewhere, a cricket waits. It listens now and practices at night. <laughs> That's your bedtime story. Um, so that story actually has a number of elements that are sort of sympathetic to ancient Chinese or maybe even I think Stafford, like almost all uh, contemporary American poets, was some, somehow influenced by ancient Chinese thinking and art and poetry. Um, it has seasons, which is very important for Chinese because they were really thoroughly engaged with the natural world and pro a natural process. It has, it's about death and regeneration. At the end and the beginning are, s about s are still and silent and s stillness and silence are uh, very important. Uh, and that extreme point, there's that extreme point where everything begins and ends, uh, which is dead winter, sort of winter solstice moment when everything is dark. Uh, and, um, and that you'll sort of find in Chinese. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up again. And again, that sort of is uh, equated with silence. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, ancient Chinese conceptual world. Um, it's, very, it's very ancient. It goes back uh, many, many thousands of years and it's far away. But it's also very contemporary. Like I said, all, all of, a huge percentage of art, artists in the 20th century, especially the second half of the 20th century, were influenced very deeply somehow by Chinese um, art. So it's very, it is, they were influenced because they felt something very contemporary about it. Uh, it's profoundly feminist. It um, agrees with the modern scientific worldview. It's, and it's also profoundly spiritual at the same time. And it's deep, deeply ecological. So in a sense, what I'm going to be talking about is deep environmental thinking. Um, and that sort of begins with an experience that we have pretty generally in the West and the Chinese knew also. And that is a feeling of separation from, uh, from the world, from the, the earth. And in the West, that separation comes from a couple of reasons. One is because we all inherit the idea that we're spirits, sort of immortal spirits, and that means and there's also this sort of spirit matter dichotomy. So there's, there's this deep dualism in the West. And that means that we, this self or soul, what we call soul, is radically different from the earth. So there's that very fundamental separation, almost like we don't belong to the earth, but we belong somewhere else. Uh, we're just visiting here. Um, there's a... A very, it's, I don't know how far I want to go into this, but there's a very deep source for that. And one is that language creates that because language is this system that goes on in our head and, and it's all about referring to something in the world. It's mimetic. So words refer to things in the world. So in a sense, that separates us from the world in a very profound way because we're made out of language. 
Also, perception seems to do that, although I think we'll find out it doesn't, but it seems to be we're perceiving something outside of us. That might sound a little mysterious, but I'll get to that. So Chinese, for ancient Chinese, insight and wisdom, what wisdom texts talked about, what went on in poetry and painting and calligraphy was all about sort of overcoming that perception, um, that separation, and reweaving us into natural process of the world. Um, and that, that was essentially what spirituality, spirituality was for them. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about how they did that, what the conceptual world looked like, how it shaped the art, so you can see, uh, uh, so you can see this conceptual world really working, uh, and and um, and maybe see how it feels. So I want to start this painting that's up. I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's going to come back and back because I'm going to, one thing I'm going to do is just kind of dig into this painting and see what's different about it from paintings, from what we might see at first glance or from Western paintings and why, why it's different. But I want to start exploring all these ideas with a mind experiment. So I need you to do this in your heads as I describe it. Um, it's a way of sort of going back to, trying to get back and see what's most real about the self and about the cosmos, the world around us. So the way, the way to start, and it will get us back to a place where we can start talking about ancient Chinese um, conceptual world. The way to start is to sort of close your eyes, maybe imagine you're standing in a field someplace, and start forgetting, forget all of, the, all of your ideas, all the ideas of our culture, everything you believe, forget everything about yourself, all of your memories, who you are, what you are, and just stop there and kind of look around inside your head and see what you find. You shouldn't find much. You should have forgotten everything in there, all of your ideas, all of our cultural ideas, scientific ideas, religious ideas all your memories, all of your um, emotions, all of your thoughts. So just feel what that feels like for a minute. Imagine you're doing this and you're in a field someplace, some field you know that you like. And then now we've gotten rid of all of our ideas about things about the world. Let's just open our eyes and see without any ideas what, is what, we, what we encounter when you open your eyes. And I think what you encounter, the first thing you notice, you'll notice a few things, but the first thing you notice is that there's this stuff all around. There's, the, there's matter, material. There's the field. There are trees, there might be mountains in front of you, there's sky, maybe there are people, maybe there's a village, but there's all this just stuff. And that's kind of amazing because there might just as well be nothing in the universe, but there's something, there's stuff all around us, there's a material universe. So that's the first thing, and if, if you really empty your head and open your eyes, then it's completely wondrous that you encounter this, of all things. The next thing to notice, you're sitting there still with your mind empty. You're confronting this existence, just this field of existence. And you notice that your, your mind is empty and you're encountering this existence. And there isn't any difference between you and existence because there's nothing separating you. There are no ideas. There's no language. There's nothing. So, you feel, you begin to feel what I was started talking about, and that is there, that consciousness and the world are really one thing. It's only when, we start, only when we start having ideas, language, and beliefs that we start separating out. So it's a great experiment or experience to like try to reweave yourself, just, as, just to find out what's going on, where the beginning place is. So that's the first thing to notice, or the second thing to notice. That empty mind and the, and the world, there's no real distinction between them. They're, um, 
And I'll come back to this and we'll do this experiment in a different format for whatever you missed this time. But if you start looking around, if you stay there for a second or five seconds or five minutes or five months, five years or five million years, next thing you notice is this, this stuff around you doesn't hold still. It moves. And that's, again, kind of a miracle. Why should it move? It seems it's alive. It seems to be alive. We think of the world as, well, other than animals and maybe plants, we, think of, we don't think of it as alive. But when you get down to this really fundamental existential level, it's moving and it's doing things. So it is alive in a sense. Um, and if you stay there, this next step is a little hard, but if, you, um, if you're there and you want to start saying anything about it or understanding it, you need to start thinking about it, explaining it. And this is something that's going to come back, so I'm just going to throw it out now. But that world of existence exists completely in and of itself. And as soon as, however much we say about it, explain it, um, mythologize, all of the things we do, humans do, and, have, that's, and this is sort of what human culture and scientific culture is about, is explaining the world, why, what the world is like, whether you're doing a, uh, telling myths about it or um, giving very empirical scientific explanations of it. But you notice that those words never get to the thing. If you imagine, if you imagine a poppy in the middle of the field and you get all of, all of the faculty of your university, there are all the scientists and all the theologians and poets and artists and they all do everything they can to explain this poppy and to tell you what and but in the end the poppy just sits there it's not touched by all of that explanation and as soon as we make those explanations two things happen one is um, they're just human constructs they're just so we sort of replace the poppy in the world with ourselves with our own thinking this is very important for ancient china we'll get back to and the second thing is, as I said, we, it separates us from the poppy or from the field. So then again, we're, we're not part of the world. We're separated from it. And that's, in a sense, our uh, daily situation. Um, so Chinese culture is really grounded in that moment of when you open your eyes. And I'm going to sort of try to talk about that. Um, and maybe I'll start with looking at this painting. Um, this is a painting from uh, around 1600 by a very great Chinese painter. And if you look at it, it it's kind of, it's pretty unusual in terms, it's typical, and it's typical for a Chinese painting, but it looks pretty strange for a Western landscape painting. In the West, a landscape painting would pretty much fill up the whole canvas with um, thick color, trying to make, um, trying to represent a real landscape, trying to create the illusion of that landscape. This painting doesn't seem to be doing that so much because it's so full, there's so much empty space there. Uh, this, the person who made it was happy to write over the top of it, which in the West would seem pretty strange, maybe sacrilegious. Um, and uh, it doesn't use much color. This has more color than most Chinese paintings, but there's no attempt to render all the different elements in that landscape or the two people in it as realistic things. Like the, the, the primary figure, the one I'll talk about, is the, the taller one. The other one is an attendant, and he's not so interesting to us for what I'm talking about. Uh, his robes would have been painted in in various colors to sort of render them as real robes, but this person's robes are just empty. There's no color in them. There's just a uh, scant outline. Uh, this painting, a lot of the landscape is, is not there. It's kind of hidden in mist and fog, 
And that happens a lot in Chinese painting. And that's, there's a reason for that, too. So what I want to start doing is sort of describing this Chinese conceptual world and cosmology uh, that is underneath this painting. And that sort of will get us back to that thought experiment. So the first thing is that um, the Chinese divided the cosmos into two fundamental elements. One is absence, and the other one is presence. Um, presence is uh, essentially what you saw when you opened your eyes. The all, all of the, they also call it the 10,000 things, all the 10,000 things in the world, people, cities, mountains, rivers, everything. That's presence, the empirical world. Absence is the, the source of the empirical world. That is, everything, everything in the empirical world appears seemingly out of nothing and goes through its life and then disappears. Absence is where the, those things appear and where they disappear. Um, I guess it's a little like the animal that's drinking up sound because it's the thing that, that everything disappears into. Um, so you, you can think of it in the seasons. Winter is like that absence. It's a pregnant emptiness. In winter, everything is dead, but it's full of potential life. So in spring, that absence, that death is kind of is reborn. Spring is regenerated. And then summer is the sort of full flourishing, and then autumn is the dying back into emptiness. Um, so if you're in that field that I was describing long enough, you start seeing not just change, but you saw, see things appearing and disappearing, including yourself. You're gonna, you appeared and you will die. Um, so this is, what, this is why the Chinese can have this absence presence. They needed to explain why do things disappear? And, and, and appear. They don't just change and they don't, they don't just exist. They don't just change, but they appear and disappear. Um, so the, the, one of the really profound things about this and a very different from the West is that this is a generative worldview. This is why I call it profoundly feminist because it sees the cosmos as this harmonious and generative organism. Is that's, that's what absence is essentially, you could think of it as a kind of a womb. It's like, it's what is constantly generating reality. And, and that's how change happens. It's constant generation and death and regeneration. Um, so you can see, just to, we'll go back to the painting now, just for starters. Um, Well, what I actually, I want to back up. What I want to say about that world, that this generative worldview I'm describing, it's a very, very primitive worldview. Most primal cultures would, would have a worldview, something like that. Chinese was an extremely sophisticated high civilization even 2,500 years ago. But they kept their, the, 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 their primitive roots. And this is, I have this, let's see, these are, Neolithic pots where you can sort of see that generative worldview absence and a kind of dynamic energy coming out of the absence. Like the black lines are that energy. And there's another one. So a Chinese painting like this, one of the things it's doing is painting this, uh, this cosmology. So you have Absence is all the empty space in this painting, which is all the mist and fog. And presence is the, the little bit of landscape that you can see, the mountains and then the mountaintop that the person is standing on. So those mountains almost feel like they've just come out of the absence and they're kind of hovering there and they're about to disappear back into it. So that's, that's one really fundamental explanation for what this, why this painting looks the way it looks. Um, 
because it's trying to make us feel like we're back there at that origin point where things appear and disappear. Um, so this process of absence and presence generating and cha generating um, the uh, reality is the process of change. And so change is very important to them. The, in the West, we are, we are very enamored of permanence. We, we, people want permanence. They want a soul that's permanent and immortal. We want ideas that are permanent. Um, but in China, empirical reality doesn't really have a lot of permanence. Everything is changing. Everything is appearing and disappearing. Everything is falling apart and dying. Um, and the Chinese accepted that and tried to make a spirituality out of that. Um, and the, they had a, um, they also had a, a kind of a myth, a mythology of change, which came up in their art, art the world of art, which is the dragon, uh, which I'm going to return to a couple of times. Oh, here's another painting where you can see that absence and presence, the mountains sort of in this misty, uh, uh, texture. And also at the bottom of that is a stream on the left. You can see a little waterfall and the lake is right on the bottom is a lake is lake water. But here's a and here's an image of a dragon. The image of all creation and all destruction. So people feared the dragon and they also revered it. Uh, a dragon could be as little as small as a silkworm, and it's the whole cosmos at the same time. It's so just a total myth that they had, that a way of embodying this difficult idea. Not that they really believed there were dragons wandering around the countryside exactly. There's another one. And here's a really fabulous one. <clears throat> this is from a huge scroll that's in Boston. It has nine dragons on it. It's about 20 or 30 feet long. And uh, one interesting thing, this, enter, this, this um, process of change uh, is, is, is driven by a lot of energy. So you th sort of see in it the energy of the cosmos. And artists, and we'll see later, um, when you're making art, Chinese artists wanted to, wanted to move like the cosmos moves, not separate from it, but like the cosmos moves. So you, and here in this painting, not only is this person painting dragons, which are the image of change, but if you look on the left, see all that paint that's splattered all over the place? That's the artist sort of, the energy of him making art. He's willing to embody that energetic process of change and instead of carefully paint, he's okay with just throwing paint at the canvas. And that is exactly the same impulse. You know, all know this painting? This is Jackson Pollock. This is from the, the 50s, around 1960. He's doing exactly the same thing. He, he, wanted, he wanted to stop painting reality out there. He wanted to stop copying nature. He wanted to be nature. So he just started throwing paint, dripping paint, swirling paint, acting like the cosmos acts. Exactly the same idea as that other, as that Chinese painter had. The Chinese painter, that painting is from uh, 12 or 1300. But anyway, I'm trying to show it's contemporary too. Uh, that's not so different from uh, also other impulses post-war impulses like improvisational jazz. Um, and there's a lot of poetry that's kind of process poetry and high energy, breath-driven poetry. Uh, OK, so back to this thing. <clears throat> I just want to complicate this a little bit. The Chinese really believe that like I said, if you, as soon as you start talking about something, you're gonna, about fundamental reality, then you're going to miss it. 
And this whole absence presence thing, they knew that about that. So if you actually look deeply enough, there's no difference between absence and presence. Um, they're part of one fundamental tissue. Uh, that those two ideas are just an approach to try to get us, to try to point us into this deep reality. Um, you could, another way of describing absence and presence, uh, which sounds a little less grand and cosmological, but is form and formless. Absence is formless. It's the same tissue of reality, empirical reality or ontological reality. Seen, we can see it with all of its individual forms like trees and mountains and everything. Or we can see it, all of that stuff as one tissue, which it is. It's all one fundamental tissue that keeps taking different shapes and dissolving back into that tissue and taking other shapes. That's essentially what we're talking about. We're not talking about metaphysics. So from that, I want to um, go back to another version of that uh, exper thought experiment in the field. Um, so we can see this cosmology sort of directly inside of consciousness. And that's um, the ancient Chinese, all these people, the painter who, by the way, is probably, the, the, the painter is probably the guy standing on that mountaintop. I think he was painting himself looking out at uh, the mountains. And he's standing there looking out essentially at that moment when you opened your eyes. Uh, no thoughts in his mind, no ideas, just trying to be part of this landscape. And he was a very, like most artists in ancient China, very serious Chan, that's Buddhist, that's a Zen Buddhist. Um, and for Chan Buddhism, Chan means meditation. So I'm gonna describe the kind of meditation he does that gets him to the point that he could do that. Um, so once again, they sort of close your eyes and imagine, this time you can imagine yourself in a monastery up in the mountains someplace, a Chan monastery. And you're sitting, or you don't have to, you can do it right here. You're sitting there, close your eyes and start watching your mind and see what happens. And if you just watch for a minute, what you probably see happen is thought. You're thinking, thoughts are coming and going, coming and going. They appear and they, maybe they evolve and they change into another thought and then they, maybe they go back to the original thought. And then that maybe fades away and a new thought comes. So what the Chinese saw in that is that, wow, consciousness, which we in the West think of as completely separate from the natural, so-called natural world. Notice the word nature means everything not human, so even that word assumes this distinction between us and nature. So they see, they see that thoughts coming and going like that, that's exactly how absence and presence works out in the world. So they realized they were looking at this process of presence emerging out of this pregnant emptiness, absence, in their minds, that their mind works the same way that the whole cosmos works. So that's pretty amazing. Then, if you sit and watch your thoughts long enough, watch them come and go and come and go, if you, these people sitting in monasteries would, could do this for hours and hours and hours a day, eventually those thoughts sort of, sort of get bored with thinking and the thoughts start feeling, falling silent. And then you realize that there's this kind of empty, you, then you're just there with that emptiness, the empty, that empty, generative emptiness that thoughts were coming out of. That's what they called empty mind or no mind, um, and is no different for them than absence, that absence I was describing operating in the cosmos. Um, now an amazing thing happens right about now is you realize we usually identify ourselves with thoughts, the thoughts and memories and feelings we have going on in our minds all the time. But we just sat and watched those thoughts as if we were somewhere else. And we watched those thoughts fall silent. And then you start realizing, oh, well, maybe I'm not the same thing as those thoughts. Maybe I'm something more fundamental. 
Um, and that's what they would call that empty mind, which you can also think of as empty perception. It's just this awareness that watches things. And we actually have this go, you, you have this going all day long, all of you, because if you walk around and you're absorbed in thoughts, you sort of don't notice things. But if something's surprising or beautiful, if suddenly a rainbow's in the sky in front of you, suddenly it will completely absorb you and you won't be thinking anymore. You'll just be that perception. If you watch what happens in your mind, you're just that perception of the rainbow. So what they, this idea of perception becomes very important for the Chinese because once you have that empty mind, once the thoughts are gone and you open your eyes and look, it's like your mind is a mirror of, there's nothing, there's no thoughts getting in the way. So when you look at something, it's mirrored in, in consciousness. And that's a little bit like getting back to that first thought experiment where um, you open your eyes and there's no difference between you and the world you're looking at. It's because the mind is a mirror. Perception is a mirror. We don't notice it, we don't think about it, but that's what's going on all the time. It's sort of, to me, this is one of the great miracles of being alive is that the world around us is always inside of us because of our eyes. Because of, uh, our, um, because of perception, you know, your eyes and a nervous system. Um, so this mirroring perception is a kind of spiritual act for Chinese. They took it very seriously. It's a place where you reweave yourself into the world around you because there's no distinction between you and the world. And it becomes very important for the arts. In fact, really fundamental. So when if you were ancient Chinese and you saw this painting, looking at this painting would be a kind of almost, I don't want to, they weren't religious people, they were philosophical people, but it would be a deep spiritual experience. You would look at it with an empty mind and mirror it in your mind. And as you mirrored it, you would be mirroring this world of absence and presence. It's like a microcosm of reality, uh, kind of a distillation because it's all right there and easy to see. So people would sit and look at a painting like this for hours and just be absorbed in it and um, sort of learning from it like it's a great teacher. Um, that, uh, let's see, what's next? Yeah, on this painting, the same thing. You can look at this, just imagine looking at this for hours with that empty mind. And here's another one. I don't know if you can see what that is. There's a figure there, sort of in the, almost in the center. And on the, le on the right, he's standing on a uh, kind of a ledge, and, and on the right are cliffs. And on the left, there's some more cliffs and some uh, a branch hanging down, a tree hanging down with some blossoms hanging down there. You can see a little bit of red. So this painting is a, a good example of Remember I mentioned how when, they, when Chinese artists create, they're trying to create with the energy of the universe, the cosmos. You can really see it in this painting because unlike a Western painting that tries to, tries to um, uh, imitate reality or represent reality, uh, this isn't really, Chinese don't care so much about that. If you look at this, look at the, oh, if, if the Western people, or trying to represent reality, they are not interested in showing you their brush strokes. They want to hide their brush strokes. They want to hide their work. But here, you, if you look at those brush strokes for a minute, and you see they look just like brush strokes. They're not hiding themselves at all. They look like very energetic brush strokes. And if you look at it long enough and, and think about, oh, those just look like brush strokes, then the illusion starts crumbling, the illusion of the landscape. And then it's a little bit like presence disappearing into absence in your mind as you look at it. So that's a kind of magical painting. There aren't a lot of paintings that are, do that so dramatically. Um, so anyway, that cosmology I described is in Chinese paintings. And there are two main ways it's, it's in the tradition. I'm going to show you a bunch of Chinese paintings now. That there are two main ways that's represented, or two poles. One is minimalist, in which there's very little in the painting like this, that's almost all empty. So this kind of emphasizes emptiness and the, and the very 
the 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 um, the wonder of things appearing out of emptiness because there are very few things so you really notice each thing there like the tree or the rocks and can you see the little fisherman in the middle of the lake uh, right in the center and the left um, and then there's the kind of maximal approach which of this, which is this very famous painting these paintings are uh, almost two, th no, let's see, 1,200, almost 1,000 years old. Uh, so this painting makes you feel that feeling when you, that you f hopefully feel when you first opened your eyes in that thought experiment, just the sheer wonder of all this, of this existence. Because it doesn't, it, it feels like, especially that cliff is just kind of booming out at you. It almost feels like a sound. And here's some, Here's some smaller or details of that painting. Now you're sort of getting inside it and further inside of it. Another um, remarkable thing about Chinese painting and how they're trying to, how they see the human world and the natural world as woven together is that almost always in Chinese paintings, the human element is either not there or it's very small. Like in this painting, the human element, now that this is a, uh, an enlarged detail, you can see in the lower right uh, travelers, you see horses and a couple of people. Can you see those? Yeah. And in the, almost to the top right, you can see a monastery sort of half hidden. Uh, do I keep going? No. And go back to this one, the only human thing in this is that fisherman out in the middle of emptiness, out in the middle of absence. Um, so here, so now Chinese painting moves between those poles of kind of w the wonder of huge overwhelming existence and the kind of absence and minimalism trying to emphasize the emptiness. So here's one example with a little one person crossing a bridge in the lower center. Lots and lots of absence, but also that those huge rocks are kind of resonate the way that big painting did. Here's another one. This is described as a kind of dragon mountain, mountains that were being about to, I forget how they describe it, about to, in, the, in a kind of cosmic or in a kind of Cosmic wind and this dragon is about to lift off and fly away. Here's a detail of it. So this is a little more on the, on the wonder side of those poles. So I'm going to move on to calligraphy, um, which is a Chinese art form which is completely unique in the world and it's very difficult. People in the West think it's impossible to approach, but it's not really. And it's not just nice handwriting. It's in fact more revered as an art form than painting. It's considered the clearest, deepest way of seeing um, the insight or wisdom of, a, of, a, of an artist. Um, so when we read when we look at texts, when we read, we don't ever think about the empty space around the words, right? All we think about is the black, the text. But in ancient China, they thought about the empty space around the words, too. And a, and a piece of calligraphy like this, one thing it does is animates that empty space. So you have the, the characters, and instead of having just characters Let's see if I can show you. Yeah, that's what Chinese characters look like, just in standard form. They're very regular. They fit into a little box. Um, and it's easy to, you can't, even if you can't read them, you can easily distinguish their parts. Um, quite different from this. You can sort of see where characters begin and end. Chinese is read from top right down. So you start, start in the top right corner and see a character. And then two little dots, which sort of mean, which is a ditto mark, actually, because it means that that character recurs. But then the next, then you see another character. But then if you keep reading, they start blurring together. It starts getting hard to see what, what's a character and what's not. So 
One thing that calligraphy is doing, besides animating the empty space around characters, because the empty space in, a, in calligraphy works a lot like empty space in a painting. It's that pregnant emptiness. It's that absence. And the language is presence. And I'll come back to this a couple more times. So language in ancient China works just like um, painting and just like the world. There's emptiness, there's empty space, and it generates text, or it generates language. So, uh, so calligraphy animates that empty space and makes us really notice it. The other thing it does is um, it moves, as I was saying, a calligrapher moves with the energy of the cosmos. That's a big part of calligraphy. And this is a really wild piece of calligraphy, very famous. It's uh, 12 or 1300 years old. Um, in which you can, it's really not readable anymore. The whole idea of this is to just lose, for the calligrapher to lose himself, all of separation, all sense of identity, and just create this the way a thunderstorm crea is created, the way a thunderstorm unfolds. Um, and that was a, a deeply spiritual act um, because that was the point of spirituality was to re reintegrate us into the cosmos. Um, and when we look at a piece of calligraphy like this, it's not really about reading it. You kind of, you kind of watch, uh, use your attention, you think of your attention as a point of, a focus of attention and you have that focus of attention follow the brush stroke. So you can kind of experience the brush stroke as it moves. And this is more like abstract expressionist painting, like that Pollock painting, than it is like handwriting. Um, you don't have to be able to read it. You just have to experience that energy. Um, and that energy, calligraphy sort of comes first and then painting, like that painting I showed you with the very brush strokes that really looked like brush strokes. That is the same energy as this. And that painter learned calligraphy first and was using calligraphic brush strokes for their energy. Um, so as I said, this is sort of like an abstract, here's a, a close up of that last one where you can really see characters just kind of dancing all over the page. And this is a contemporary painter named Bryce Marden who also, who was very influenced by calligraphy and just wanted to make paintings out of that same energy, the way the ancient calligraphers did, but he wanted to make them in a contemporary mode. He's a really, a very, very well-known painter right now. He's uh, probably, uh, I don't know, 75 years old or 80. Okay, um, so poetry is the last of the three arts I want to mention. This is a line of poetry, what, what Chinese poetry looks like, what Chinese language looks like. Um, and as I said, and poetry operates with the same cosmology. There's, if you look at this and you, and you sort of read it just looking at my English equivalents, you see that there's a lot missing in this. A, a lot of what we need in English is not here in this Chinese. So the Chinese is really is the least possible linguistic elements suspended in empty space. And to read it, you kind of have to piece those together and draw meaning out of the empty space. This is what I was talking about when I first showed the calligraphy. The empty space around the calligraphy is like that generative absence. And the, and the words are kind of feel like they're on the verge of, as you're trying to make meaning out of them, they feel like they're on the verge of going back into that emptiness. So you have to draw them out. And one of the first things you notice here that's missing is there's no subject in this sentence. So in English, we can't get anywhere without a subject. But in Chinese, especially Chinese poetry, subjects are very often not there, and lots of other stuff is often not there. Um, like you read these words and you don't know how they fit together, because in English we have lots of um, little connective words like and, but, um, this, that. 
we have um, verb tenses. Chi ancient Chinese didn't have any verb tenses, so we don't, it, we don't know when this happened. It just happens in that, really, it happens in that generative moment of, absent, of presence emerging from absence. Um, so you have to fill in an I at the beginning of that sentence. I don't, I'm not aware of autumn beginning. The other interesting thing about Chinese is that it is a pictographic language. And in, in the West, well, virtually all other languages anywhere are alphabetic. Alphabetic languages, I don't know, maybe a lot of you know this, but alphabetic languages are designed to replicate speech, the sounds of speech. So the word tree has nothing to do, no necessary connection with the tree in the world. It's uh, just a social convention. And it's spelled that way because the written language is trying to render the sound of speech. Chinese doesn't do that, uh, at least not originally. It does some of that. In a, a one dimension of it is phonetic. Phonetic is that idea of replicating the sound. Uh, it's pictographic. That is, it, their picture, a Chinese character is a picture, often a picture of the thing in the world that it's referring to. Like a tree looks like a tree. I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you too much of that at this moment, but this is the oldest surviving Chinese writing. They're called oracle bones and they're about um, 3,000 years old or so. And here's another one, and you can see some pictures, like right in the center of that, you can see an animal like a horse or a cow. See that? And three characters down from three characters down from that, you can see a cart with two wheels and a kind of like the wagon of the cart. Um, in the top right, you can see a thing that looks like a tree with a with a, a straight line down, which is the trunk, and then a line like this, which are branches, and then a line like this, which are the roots. You see that in the top? If you go all the way in the top right corner and start down toward the diagonally to the left, it come, you see it quickly. So that's a picture of a tree. So Chinese characters, Chinese language, remember I described um, one of the things that keeps separates us from the world is that language is mimetic. It's like we think of a tree referring to a tree, but in Chinese, that actually sort of actually is the tree. And so there's a, they don't have that same separation. That's kind of complicated. Um, okay, so that's sort of that's sort of um, that's sort of that. So the the main point is cosmol that co that cosmology structures everything in ancient China. It structures the cosmos with absence and presence generating change. It structures painting and calligraphy and poetry, all the arts. It structures language, the structure of language. It structures consciousness. They all fit together in this kind of tissue. And it structures perception. And you know, you can do this, you could probably do this, well, you know, you could do this in the West. If you will go all the way down and get the basic cosmolo cosmology of the West, you can see how it, how it generates the form of language, how it generates the forms of the arts, um, how it generates what we experience as ourselves. Um, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, so what I want to do, how I want to end is um, read from a passage from this book uh, this is a book I wrote a few years ago. I've been translating Chinese poetry for about 30 years. And one of the reasons I do it is because I, well, one, for one, one thing, it's Chinese poetry has been a huge part of modern American poetry. That's sort of where I started. Um, but quickly, I, I, I started thinking of it as a way of creating poetry outside of Western conventions and ideas. And I started thinking more and more about this whole worldview I've been describing that's underneath Chinese poetry and shapes it. 
And I've been, so I've been, in a sense, then I started thinking of myself as translating in order to translate that worldview into um, Western language so people could experience it. And eventually, after doing lots of books, I decided I was going to write essays going straight at that. But I wanted to make them essays that tried to make that cosmology actually happen in, in experience, not just an academic book. Um, so I wrote this, which is um, kind of works through that whole cosmology, but it does it by, there's a mountain near where I live in Vermont and I hike up a co every couple of weeks. And I've been there for 25 years, so I probably walked up it 400 times now. And it's called Hunger Mountain, that's the name of the book. Um, so I did, so what I did is each chapter is a walk up this mountain. And as I walk up the mountain, things happen and I think about things, think and try to think, and tr in a sense, to walk up the mountain the way an ancient Chinese poet might have walked up the mountain, which is with a very different framework, mental framework. Um, so each chapter is a walk up the mountain. Each chapter has a Chinese word for a title. So I'm going to read you. Wait, let me see. I always get distracted. Let's see if I missed anything. That's another Bryce Marden painting, that, another calligraphic sort of thing. That's that painting again. OK, so I'm going to sh actually now I'm going to show you some pictographic stuff as I read this chapter. But this chapter, that's a character for dragon. So this, char this chapter is called Dragon. <clears throat> and it's sort of about that. Remember the, the dragon that I described? Let's see. Yeah. And how I described it as um, the mythological sort of um, representation of change, the, that, the fundamental energy of the cosmos. <coughs> so I'm going to read this. This is, um, you'll see it's a walk up the mountain, but also sort of engaging with this, I, trying to see this idea of how this idea of dragon works in the, in the landscape. So dragon. Mm. Wait a second. The valleys are lost in, mist, in cloud and mist that thins as it billows across mountain slopes and trails out over ridgeline hollows. The view from Hunger Mountain's summit today has all the elements of an ancient landscape painting, but the wind churning through it brings something more into view besides, something rarely glimpsed in those paintings or here in the Green Mountain ridgeline stretching away north and south of this Hunger Mountain summit. Dragon's dynamic life usually remains hidden here because its movements take place only across geologic time spans. But as I watch summits roam empty expanses of mist, ridgelines breathing in and out of view, dragons seem everywhere rippling and writhing in these mountains. Feared and revered as the awesome force of change of life itself, the dragon is China's mythological embodiment of all creation and all destruction. The 10,000 hunger-driven things tumbling through their traceless transformations. Dragon's name captures its nature exactly. Uh, this is the old, one of the old images for dragon, which contains two images coursing with energy. The element on the graph's left side is a schematic figure of the dragon's body deriving from early forms of the graph showing a tail ben below the body and then above the body a pair of legs and a frightening head. The element on the right added later is an abbreviated rendering of various forms for the graph meaning flight. So now the right side of this is the flight side. There's one image or that image, is an image of wings. Or this one showing a crane in flight. You see the crane, the huge w big wings on the bottom and then a long arcing neck and a head. Although the Chinese dragon has no wings, it does soar and wings are the obvious image for flight as in this exquisite oracle bone rendering of the graph with its implied vistas 
and sense of gusty breezes buffeting two birds on the wing. Today I'm gazing out across Dragon in the form of a writhing Appalachian range that was thrust at least 35,000 feet up when the continental plates of Europe and Africa collided with the North American plate 380 million years ago. When the European and African plates eventually broke away from North America 200 million years later, they carried with them parts of the Appalachian range. So Dragon's spiny ripples and twists stretch not only up and down the east coast of North America, but also northeastward across Scotland and Scandinavia, as well as southeastward into Northwest Africa. So you see what I'm doing? It's like see, trying to see this, rid, this whole long mountain chain as the dragon's body, which is, in a, sen it's in a sense, it, it is. Um, looking out from the summit, I can see only a small part of Dragon's intercontinental sprawl, but if I descend through scraps of mist to the mountain's uppermost stream crossing, I find Dragon in a much more approachable form. Just uphill of the trail, it breaks into view as stream water starts down a 20-foot wall of red-brown phyllite. It snakes across the upper wall, then rises back, descending left along a sloping ledge, water brimming off and down sunlit moss beneath to a broken hollow near the center of the wall. Seething there, it tumbles out and down, brilliant with light, to a larger ledge that transects the wall from the far left, whereupon it spreads out and divides into two forms, one sheeting thin down glistening moss-covered wall the other spraying out and cascading the final 10 feet down to a rocky pool, seething again and restless to move on. As I leave the waterfall and continue down the mountain, each sight goes all the way inside me to the very bottom of what I am and vanishes there, pure mystery eluding me perfectly. It's elemental the way things become me for a moment, filling awareness and then simply vanish forgotten completely as they open a place for whatever occurs next. And the more clearly I attend to things, the more clearly they vanish into me. The cosmos is all dragon, all generative transformation driven by a restless hunger, and perception shares this dragon nature, as does any other dimension of this being I am. Thoughts, feelings, memories, desires, they all keep relentlessly appearing and evolving and disappearing into the forgetfulness that is the texture of our day-to-day -day lives. We tend to ignore the disappearing, the forgetfulness, but all day long, day in and day out, forgetfulness keeps us woven into dragons' traceless transformations. Self, that center of identity, is a denial of dragon and the empirical reality it represents, the generative female structure of consciousness and cosmos. It is a denial of forgetfulness and of our actual moment-to-moment -moment experience. That denial is part of dragon, of course, but it is dragon's blindness to itself. And as the defining structure of the center, language is the medium of that blindness. It too is a denial of forgetfulness and absence and the generative nature of things. Linguistic thought is a system of presence and it's easy to assume presence is essence. It's easy to assume that in language we can grasp the essence of things. This is a bedrock assumption in the mainstream Western philosophical tradition. But everything we know about this cosmos, about its vast and intricate natural history, the equations describing its day-to-day -day web of energy transfers and all our stories and myths and legends, all of that imagination and knowledge is part of the center, this body of understanding and memory and thought that I am. Even after the most exhaustive scientific description, the most accurate philosophical account or the most concise and imagistic poem the 10,000 things remain, in and of themselves, a mystery beyond me. Once I try to explain, the center replaces the mystery, 
even if I speak in wondrous legends describing the mystery itself, China's legend of dragon, for instance. Ten minutes downslope from the waterfall, I detour a few hundred yards up a side trail to another favorite stream crossing, where water forms a number of pools as it works its way down a narrow cleft through large blocks of pale schist. As I gaze into one of those pools, it seems to be seething with hidden energy. Beneath the pool's mirrored surface, legend says, dragon is settling in for winter. Small as a silkworm and vast as all heaven and earth, according to those legends, dragon descends into deep waters in autumn where it hibernates until spring, when its reawakening means the return of life to earth. It rises and ascends into sky where it billows into thunder clouds and falls as spring's life-bringing rains. Its claws flash as lightning in those thunder clouds and its rippling scales glisten in the bark of rain-soaked pines. It can rear up into a mountain, surge in scrawled ridgelines stretching away blue through broken mist and cloud or cascade in tumbling stream water. It can clench itself into a beating heart or twist in a sudden turn of thought, appearing then disappearing only to reappear in another form of hunger, presence seething through absence, absence through presence, dragon moves, all sleight of hand shimmering in and out of view. Standing here beside the stream, I can hear all that absence and presence. I had Meniere's disease a few years ago, which left one ear all but deaf. I listened to my left and there's stream water clamoring over rocks, clattering into pools, presence. I listened to my right and there's nothing, no stream water clamoring and, and clattering, absence. And the deafness is odd, somehow amplifying and echoing internal sounds so I can hear a heartbeat resounding through my body, the pulse of it, presence, absence, presence, absence. Dragons were thought to be deaf and the Chinese graph for deafness combines the image for an ear uh, with the image for a dragon to create uh, the graph like that, dragon on top and ear on the bottom. Hence, the language tells me that I'm deaf as a dragon. And to be old and worn out, perhaps with the appearance of disappointment and weariness, as I am getting to be, was described as dragon concentrated the same dragon that wanders in the form of continents drifting through their massive slow motion collisions, dragons thrust up into towering peaks, lazing in the form of mile deep glaciers that scoured those high peaks away, and idling in these low summits they left behind, all veined with tumbling streams like this one. Dragon breathing through the ceaseless modulations of weather that are slowly wearing this mountain away with wind and rain. And today brought the low clouds and ridgeline mist of my walk among the ripples and folds of dragon's body. When I listen, I listen with the ears of dragon. When I breathe, I breathe with the lungs of dragon. And when I look up from the stream, and gaze into this mountain trailing out streamers of mist in its geologic flight. Dragon gazes into dragon. So that's that essay. Here's some, I'll show you dragon once more. And um, I, think, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So, thank you.